I think this is the time. So we start our last lectures today with Sergey. Okay, so um, so now fill in uh, Lagrangian to Turai. Fill in Lagrangian. Consider the following situation. Everything is in C2, uh, and uh, I will denote the coordinates Z and W, and uh, in fact, I will use this notation. Capital Z is ZW, okay? So uh, this is the standard symplectic form of C2. And I suppose that J is an almost complex structure which is globally defined on C2 and which is tamed by the standard symplectic form. So J is tamed by a I mean, standard. Uh, so then A is the complex matrix of G. Of G. And as far as I remember, Sergei explained in his talk that uh, the fact that J is tamed by this amplitude 4 means that at every point Z of C2, the norm of this matrix, the norm with respect to the usual Euclidean metric, the norm is small, strictly smaller than 1. Uh, this is exactly equivalent to the fact that J is tamed by a mega standard. But I uh, will impose uh, a little bit stronger conditions. So we are I suppose that the following things hold. So assumptions. Assumptions. So the first one is there exists uh, a constant A0 such that this norm is smaller or equal than A0. For every Z of C2, capital Z of C2. This is the usual uh, matrix norm which is induced by the standard Euclidean metric of R4. And we suppose also that this map Z, A, Z is, uh, is uniformly continuous. <laughs> uniformly continuous on C2. Well, this is for some technical reasons in order to have uh, good global isoperimetric properties for, for, for the structure. In fact, for applications, it will be automatically, uh, this condition will be automatically satisfied because, in fact, the difference between A and the standard simplex. In fact, in applications, uh, the support of this function will, will be compact, so it will not be a problem. Okay, well, so do not take it very seriously. The second assumption is this map is J complex. And the th third assumption is, well, there exists the zero in D such that the vertical line is J complex. So uh, the picture is the following. So we have here the unit disk, D. So we have here the X, W. And so we suppose that this line is J complex. Okay, this is the unit disk, and somewhere there is a point Z0, somewhere here, and this vertical line also is J complex. Okay, this is essentially what we need. Okay, so these two lines are J, J complex. Excuse me? Yes. Yes. Mm 
No. No. Why? There are no reasons for this because J is not standard complex structure. No. And second also, there are no reasons for this in general. No. Uh, of course, if J is standard structure, then of course every line, horizontal or vertical, will be complex. But we, if you, even if you slightly perturb the standard structure, you will lose in general. After generic perturbation, you will lose. So we need to impose this. Okay. So after this assembly, so and also I denote this. I will consider this family of tori. So this is just the tori. So here I fix. This is the boundary of the D. And so here, this tori lambda t. There, there. You can imagine that they're here. Okay. So theorem. The theorem is the following. Well, fix some value of t, fix some torus from this family. So this is not Cauchy Green operator. This is just the value of the parameter t. Okay. So then, of course, this is positive. So then, the following holds: a for every point p from this torus, there exists uh, a j complex uh, disk f d to c2 smooth up to the boundary and such that f of 1 is equal to p, that is the value of this disk uh, at point 1 exactly is equal to this Chosen point. Uh, F is an embedding. Uh, the boundary of F is attached to this torus. The image of this disk does not intersect does not intersect this horizontal line okay let me write a little bit like d multiply this and the area of this disk is equal to pi <coughs> so this is the part A, <coughs> the part B. Uh, the disks in the part A, when we vary this point P, uh, the disk form a C infinity, uh, one parameter. Family. Uh, they depend smoothly on J and and T. Uh, they are disjoint. And feel a uh, smooth levy flat hypersurface this boundary equal to the torus lambda t so this is the theorem So you have here the torus, and what this theorem says, you can find 
question uh, that you can find uh, a real hypersurface uh, in situ such that the boundary of this hypersurface exactly is equal to the story, and this hypersurface is foliated by J complex disks with this property. The area of every disk is equal to pi, disks are disjoint, and so on. So, in the case, well, so what is one, why we can hope that this theorem is true? Because in the case where I will suppose, of course, in the proof that t is equal to 1, and I will consider this tori, and everything will be for this tori, OK? Uh, if our structure is standard, j is equal to j standard, then this is absolutely trivial, obvious statement. So what we consider are this family of disks. Then we consider are this family of disks the disk of the, of the type zeta. To this where c is a constant, constant, such that the modulus of c is equal to 1. So we consider the disk such that uh, the images are graphs other the axis, other, other this axis, right? And uh, this is absolutely obvious. Then if when we, you vary this constant, this disk feel uh, a Levy flat hypersurface, Levy flat with respect to the standard structure. And this disk obviously, obviously have all these properties, right? So what we would like to prove, we would like to prove the similar statement uh, for an almost complex structure, which is very far, in some sense, from the standard one. And you will see that this gives uh, some, uh, some practical applications uh, rather immediately. So let us prove this theorem because this is a good illustration for uh, the Grom of machinery. So we proceed the proof in several steps. And we will proceed by the continuity method, which uh, uh, I described yesterday. So uh, the first step. Okay. Uh, so in fact, a T will be parameter uh, in the homotopy of almost complex structure. So uh, Sergei explained in his talk yesterday that if you have uh, an almost uh, a symplectic a manifold, then the space of all almost complex structures is contractible and so on. In our case, uh, it is uh, quite obvious because, as I, as I told, uh, the fact that a is, uh, j is tamed by omega standard means that the norm of its complex matrix is smaller than 1. So complex matrices of tamed structures form the ball uh, in the Banach space. So of course, it is co convex and obviously contractible. What I mean, uh, if we consider ta, these complex matrices, when t is between 0 and 1, there, and if we consider now j, t, uh, the almost complex structure with the, the, comple uh, with the complex matrix. Uh, Ta, well, then, uh, every, uh, then, uh, this, uh, almost, uh, then uh, this almost complex structure still satisfy all our, uh, uh, st uh, st still, st still will satisfy uh, required properties. All these almost com complex structures are tamed by mega standard. This horizontal line will be J complex. This uh, vertical line will be J com uh, uh, will be complex for every structure like this, and so. Uh, uh, we will use this homotopy in the space of almost complex structure. So when t is equal to 0, j0 is equal to j standard, and where j, j1 is equal to our initial structure j. So we start with this one, with, uh, with the structure. And so uh, I, I have to make again this picture. So we have here our disk d. We have here a z0, and this is complex line for all the structures, and this is also complex line for all the structures, right? Uh, and so uh, now, we can, uh, now we continue to 
to, uh, now we start our deformation. So we consider here this uh, our torus, and we start with uh, this disk, HC, which I wrote there. Okay. Uh, where C belongs to BD, we consider this family of disks, and uh, so this is a constant, so we have this feeling, so we, we can attach this constant disk to our torus, okay? This is not a problem. Now I use the notation, so W is equal U plus IV, and let us write, so uh, let us consider the following one form, this is 1 over 2, x dy minus y dx plus 1 over 2 uh, u dv minus v du. This is a primitive of the standard symplectic form. That is, we have this relation. This is open, right? The exterior derivative, derivative of lambda is equal omega standard. Well, so now, if we consider now uh, a disk which is closed to this one. So now let F be a J complex disk attached to lambda and close to HC. Then the area of this disk F is equal to the integral, to this integral, right? And we can apply the Stokes theorem, the Stokes formula. And we obtain that this is equal to the integral over the boundary. And this integral is quite obvious to compute because when you integrate this over the unit circle, you obtain, uh, you obtain immediately that this integral equal to the sum of widening numbers of the component uh, of the map F. Uh, the winding number of the first component, if our disk is close to this, the winding number of this component is equal to one, right? And the winding number of this component, constant is, not, constant is different from zero. So the winding number uh, here is equal to zero, right? So this integral, for every disk which is a small perturbation of this one, this integral will be equal to pi, in fact. Well, it is equal, this integral equal this integral is a sum of, of this and this when you apply every component to, to F and it is equal to every integral equal to the y the number of components multiplied by pi. So the integral will be equal to pi because the y the number of the second component is equal to zero and the y the number of the first component is equal to one, okay? So this integral always will be to pi. So this means that if we slightly perturb our structure, and if we slightly perturb our disk, for disks which are perturbed, we have estimate of the area. And this is good because uh, uh, there is a hope to apply Gromov compactness theorem uh, for such a family of disks. Okay? Well, so now we still need to arrange a little bit the things. So we will consider the disks uh, which satisfy some normalization condition. So disk will be like this f of z is equal to this. And I suppose that z of 0 is equal to z0, and I suppose that f of 1 is equal to 1q. So this is the point P of our torus. So I will consider this with these normalization conditions. And now, let us go back to this situation. So we have this initial disk. Yesterday we uh, discussed how to deform this disk uh, if you would like to uh, construct a family uh, of disks which are J-complex for a perturbed structure which is close to J0, but not J0, which is close to this one. And if we would, if we would like to construct disks which with this, the same boundary data, but which are complex with respect to the perturbed structure. We do what? We apply the implicit function theorem, as I explained uh, uh, yesterday, and uh, we have to solve a linearized problem in order to study uh, the surjectivity of the tangent map and so on, so on. So finally, we have to compute the mass of index, and the mass of index uh, of disks is stable under the homotopy. For this disk, 
the mass of index is equal to zero. It's the very uh, index which I introduced yesterday. So it's very easy to compute it. So, every, so when you write a linearized map, and so on, everything will be surjective. And the dimension of the kernel uh, for a linearized problem will be equal to three. So this means that when you perturb the structure, this disk will generate a three-dimensional family of disks. But these uh, extra parameters are killed by these normalization assumptions. And so under these normalization assumptions, it's very, very easy to see that for a perturbed structure, uh, you will obtain precisely one disk, which is J-complex for perturbed structure, and which satisfies these normalization conditions. Okay? So our Maslow index mu. So the Maslow index is equal to zero. So implicit function theorem implies that there exists a, a small delta such that for every t from the interval zero delta from this open interval, uh, there exists a unique J delta uh, uh, JT complex disk F uh, satisfying assumptions of our term. Satisfying assumptions of our term. What we want, we want to push this family of disks further uh, in the space of our structures, of our almost, contract, almost complex structures. Because what we did now on, uh, on this, on this uh, step, we start from the standard structure, and we slightly perturb by the implicit function theorem the standard structure, and we proved that for the perturbed structure, uh, we have our family of disks. But unfortunately, we still are very far from the structure J, which is given in our theorem. So we cannot uh, reach the structure just by the implicit function theorem, because the implicit function theorem is very local. Uh, this delta may be very small. Uh, so and we have to push further this construction and uh, have the same result for all t from the interval 0, 1, and with, just with the implicit function theorem. This is impossible. Okay. Yes. Yes. I do not move the torus, but I move structures. In this construction, I do not move the torus. Okay. <coughs> okay. So our plan is <coughs> to consider the sets of T for which our disks are defined and to show that the, the set is open and the set is closed. OK, so the key statement is the following lemma. OK, so, so suppose that every disk Ft when t is on this interval open from this side, this is important, does not intersect the axis z. Then there exists positive eta such that the w component of all these disks is separated from the origin uniformly by eta for all zeta in d bar and all t from 0 t 0. Okay. Proof. So what I want to say geometrically, I want to say that when I start my deformation of disks. They do something like this. They do something like this. But they are separated from this horizontal axis uniformly. Okay? They cannot approach 
arbitrary close. They cannot be arbitrary close to this axis. Okay? Why that? Well, by absurd. Okay? So we suppose that uh, there exists a sequence Fk of our disks uh, such that uh, okay, T of K, so I use this notation, this is F of T of K, and so T of K tends to T0, and these disks are not separated from this axis, so we have this, right? So uh, the area of all our disks are equal to pi. So we can apply gro a Gromov compactness theory with boundary conditions. So Gromov compactness theory. Well, what says this theorem in our situation? Well, this says the following, that, uh, if, we uh, that if we consider the images of our disk, then these disks uh, can uh, converge in the Hausdorff distance uh, to a finite Union of disks because bubble in principle can appear. Uh, what kind of bubble you, ca uh, you can have? First of all, well, in principle, in Gromov, uh, in general, in Gromov theorem, there are two kinds of bubbles. There are spherical bubbles, right, and there are disk bubbles because we, here we have totally real boundary condition. Spherical bubbles cannot appear because uh, there are no spherical bubbles uh, for our uh, almost complex structure. Let us uh, think why. So there are no Spherical bubbles. Uh, just by Stokes formula, because if you have a spherical bubble, uh, if G is a spherical bubble, so then its area must be equal to the integral of G, the image of G from the Riemann sphere of omega, but omega is globally exact. Okay? So by Stokes formula, it will be equal to the integral of the boundary, and but the boundary is empty, so it will be equal to zero. So uh, the area will be equal to zero, and so this means that uh, the, this disk must be constant. But bubble is not constant by definition. So this means that J is constant. But this is very important in Grom of compactness theorem. If bubble arises, it is not compact. Uh, sorry, it is not constant. So if there are no non-constant bubbles, this means that we have perfect convergence. So there are no spherical bubbles, OK? But we still can have disk bubbles. So this means what? The limit set. So this converges in Hausdorff distance, distance to a finite union of disks with boundaries attached to our torus lambda by Gromov compactness here. And this is a connected union, and so on. So, and uh, after suitable reparameterization of our sequence of maps Fk by uh, conformal isomorphisms uh, of the union disk, you can obtain a sequence of maps which converge to every disk from, the, to disk from this set. This is Gromov compactness theorem, essentially, in our situation, OK? If you do not parameterize, so you still have some convergence outside a finite set of points. If you uh, to some disk, which we, we can call principal disk. If you reparameterize, then you will have a convergence to, to the first bubble. You again reparameterize, you will have a convergence to the, sec to the second bubble, and so on. And like this, finite number of times. Okay? So, no, let us, so, okay, so one, at least one of these disks 
must touch this axis, right, by our assumption. So at least one of the disks. So at least one of these disks touch this axis. And we can reparameterize our sequence such that uh, inside, the disk, inside the disk, we have uniform convergence by Gromov compactness theorem. Everything is fine. It must be interior point of the disk because the boundary of this disk is glued to our toroid lambda. So the boundary is separated from the axis. So it will, the, it will be in an in interior point. Well, now I have to use uh, the, uh, the notion of positivity and stability of intersections of J-complex curves. Uh, which in principle is very, <laughs> which we did not discuss in our course, but in principle is very easy. Uh, th this is quite similar to the uh, uh, proper classical properties of a complex analytic sets. So we use positivity and stability of intersections indices of J complex curves. Well, essentially, this is uh, a consequence of uh, the things which Sergei uh, discussed yesterday in his talk. What I want, uh, what, what consequence we need in our situation? Only one. If we have a J complex curve, and if there is another complex curve, so this fixed complex curve, curve one, and if you have another complex curve, C2, which intersects this curve, then after a continuous perturbation of C2 as a family of complex curve, every perturbed curve also intersects this curve C1. This is from the, so. This is a fundamental property of J-complex curves, which is essentially corollary of intersection theory, which yesterday uh, Sergei described in a more general situation. So if C1 and C2 are J-complex curves, complex curves, with non-empty intersection, then all J-complex curves close to C2 also intersects, intersects C1. This is not true for re, uh, just for real varieties, because for instance, if you are in R2 and if you can consider two real curves, it's obviously wrong, because for instance, you consider this, right? And you now you, you move slightly this x here. So after perturbation, you have no intersection, right? But for complex curves in a complex two-dimensional manifold, this is always true, okay? And this is fundamental thing fundamental property of complex curves. Uh, for standard, for integrable structures, you can find it in any book on complex geometry uh, about complex analytic sets. And this is true for J-complex curves. It was written without proof by Gromov uh, in his uh, celebrated paper. And then it was a zero. It is a hard result, in fact, technically. It is not obvious at all uh, to prove it, because technically it is difficult. And it was a series of papers of Duzo Magdaf uh, and Mikhailov White uh, and Jean-Claude Sikorov. And finally, uh, this uh, was absolutely correctly and uh, completely proved. Okay, So uh, this is, in fact, a hard theorem in some sense. One can make a, a separate course about this, but this is true. 
Okay, so now we use this and we go back to our situation. So we obtain the contradiction immediately because this means, uh, this, uh, this general principle now means that for k big enough, our disks fk also touch our axis, which is wrong because they're, they're, because they're separated. So applying this, we obtain a contradiction. So we obtain a contradiction. which proves lemma, okay? Well, now, let us uh, continue to prove our theorem. Well, now I pretend that in fact, bubbles cannot appear at all. So consider once again this, this sequence fk. Now, now let fk be a sequence of disks. So such that fk corresponds to the value of the parameter tk and uh, tk tends to t0. So, we know that fk converges in the Gromov sense, converges to a finite union of disks after suitable reparameterization, we can obtain every disk, every bubble as a limit. So now let us parameterize nothing. Let us consider our sequence as it is. So we have uh, this normalization condition, right? So consider fk without additional reparameterization, without additional reparameterization. Then, by Gromov compactness theorem, uh, fk converges to some disk which I denote f infinity. And this is a convergence which is uniform on every compact uh, of the closed disk outside a finite uh, number of points. Converges uniformly on every compact subset of d bar minus finite set of points where bubbles open. And since we have only disk bubbles, this finite set must be in the boundary of our disk. So this is, in fact, subset in the boundary of disk, since we have no spherical bubbles. If, point, if the point is interior for the disk, only sphere can arise there, and there are no spheres. Okay, so in particular, on every compact subset of the open union disk, we have uniform convergence, okay? So this means that this limit disk satisfies uh, at least this normalization condition, right? So it is not constant, because its boundary is glued to our torus. The boundary of every disk is glued uh, to uh, our torus by the Gromov compactness theorem since we have a removal singularity theorem on the boundary, right? So convergence is not on the whole closed disk, but the limit disk has the whole boundary attached to our torus. This is not a problem by Gromov compactness theorem. Okay, so, so then, so we have this disk and we still have this. We, have, we still have this condition, which means that this disk is not constant. What is the area of this disk? The area of, of this disk is equal to this integral and so by Stokes it is equal to this integral 
and that is equal to what? It must be equal to what? To wide uh, it must be equal to uh, wide number. Uh, uh, it is pi, so the sum of wide numbers of components. Right? But the wide number of second component is equal to zero by our lemma because the second component is separated from the origin. So this is a function which does not vanish in the unit disk. So its wide number is zero. Right? So on the other hand, uh, the area must be positive because our disk is not constant. So this means that the first uh, winding number must be equal to one. It can be bigger than one because area can, all areas are equal to pi. So the only possibility, so the first is equal to winding number must be equal to one, the second must be equal to zero by lemma. So it is equal to pi, right? But now, if we consider other bubbles, we see immediately that uh, they cannot appear because the area of every bubble is not, uh, cannot be equal to zero. If bubble arises, it is not constant. And the sum of, the total sum of areas of bubbles cannot be bigger than the total area of our, of our of, of disks of our sequences. So there are no sufficiently energy for arising of bubbles. And this is very typical situation application of Gromov compactness theory. So we, so, but every, bub every bubble is not constant. So this means that its area is positive. So this means that there are no bubbles. There are no su sufficiently energy. For, bu for bubble arising. So this is very typical citation which Gromov, Gromov calls some simple homology and so on, because this is a combination of some topological reasons which implies, and together with energy estimates, which implies non-appearance of bubbles. But then we are practically done because now we obtain what? We obtain that there is just single disk in the limit. And so by Gromov compactness theorem, there are no this set. At all. The set is empty, so the convergence is perfect. We have a uniform convergence on the closed disks to F infinity, and so it will be convergence in any CL norm on D bar. So by Gromov compactness theorem, So by Gromov compactness theorem, Fk converges to F infinity in every CL D bar norm. In particular, F infinity has the same Maslow index as all disks Fk. That is, its Maslow index must be equal to zero by continuity. Because you remember, Maslow index is the one number of some coefficients which we apply when, which we obtain when we linearize uh, our boundary value problem and so on. So it uh, depends continuously on all perturbations. So it must be constant because uh, uh, the wide number is always an integer. So here we have continuity by Gromov compactness theorem, so Maslow index of the limit disk must be the same. So Maslow index mu of f infinity is equal to zero. Now I apply to f infinity uh, the implicit function theorem. So we apply to f infinity the implicit function theorem, right? And we obtain that uh, this, di uh, this disk, F infinity, uh, generates a one parameter family of disks. So F infinity generates 
refrain rates, uh, one parameter family of disks for the structures, for the structures JT, when the parameter T moves. And all our disks FK are in this, uh, generate, are in this family by the uniqueness uh, statement of the implicit function theorem. So finally we obtain what? We our, our disks are defined here, right? And we succeed to extend our family of disks further to a neighborhood of the point T0. First, we extend our family to the point T0 by this construction. Then we apply implicit function theorem and we push it further. So we extend our family of JT complex disks on zero for some epsilon positive. So we obtain that the set of T for which our disks are constructed is closed and open, so it coincides with the interval zero one, which proves the first part of the theorem. The second part uh, is immediately, uh, immediately follows by the implicit function theorem. You just apply the first part for every point of your thorax. And we construct the disks which fill a uh, Levy flat hypersurfaces. Uh, all disks will be, uh, I did not explain why, why all disks will be embedded. Uh, this is again, uh, in fact, this is not a simple thing. The initial disk is embedded, right? Because it was a graph of, of the constant. And now we construct the homotopy in the space of disks from this disk to final disk, which also is glued to our torus. And uh, all disks are J-complex, and uh, this disk is homotopic to this graph of constant. Why the uh, final disk will be uh, embedded? This is a, uh, in fact, consequence of the adjunction formula, which uh, Sergei discussed uh, yesterday in his course, because this uh, deep topological principle uh, has many useful consequences. One of consequences is the following. If you have a J-complex curve and you have a homotopy continuous family of J-complex curve, curves, and the first curve is an embedding, everything, of course, in this complex manifold of complex dimension two. Eh? If the first curve is embedded, then the last one also is embedded. So all these curves are embedded. Are embedded. The only bad things which can happen, the last curve can be multiply covered. Multiply covered means that uh, you can represent the map parametrizing this curve as a composition of a J-complex map with some uh, proper uh, holomorphic map or of the unit of the unit disk to itself of multiplicity bigger than one that is a Blaschke product but in our case this it cannot happen because we have this vertical line and from the beginning the index of intersection of all our curves with this line is equal to one so the index of intersection is stable by continuity. So index of intersection of the last curve with this line also will be equal to 1. So the last curve cannot be multiply covered. If not, its intersection index uh, will be not equal to 1. Because intersection indi indi indices uh, count uh, algebraic number of intersections with multiplicity. So all our curves are simple. Yeah, they are not multiply covered. So the last curve will be embedded. So everything remains embedded. It is important because if disks are, which appears are not embedded, uh, we cannot push them further by the implicit function theorem. Uh, it, it, will be, it will be trouble. But it doesn't happen because there are junction formula and topological properties of disks. So this concludes the sketch of the proof of this theorem. Okay? So uh, you see that we essentially used many things which were discussed in the course, implicitly. So this machine works, OK? Well, so this is the end of the proof. And now I would like to discuss application of this proof. So this is Gromov non squeezing theorem in dimension 2.
So. Grom of snow squeezing cell. So everything is in situ, and we consider the following situation. So we consider the, uh, the ball. I use this notation for the Euclidean ball. So what is my notation in order to be precise? So we consider the ball. of the radius r small. And here we consider the following situation. We consider the disk of the radius capital R. And we consider the product of this disk with C. So this is this product, Rd multiplied by C. So this is our domain. And in this product, we consider a subdomain, which I denote by G. So G is compactly contained in this product. Okay. Well, so now I suppose that there exists a map phi, which is diffeomorphism. So there exists phi, diffeomorphism between this ball and G, which is diffeomorphism. Which preserves the standard symplectic form. Uh, such diffeomorphism is called symplectic, or symplectomorphism, which preserves the standard symplectic form. OK? So now, theorem. If we have all this, then R small is smaller than capital R. So this is Gromov's Nusquizian theorem. Well, what is the meaning of this theorem, in fact? So this means what? You have here the ball of the radius R, and you consider its symplectic image, right, on this domain. It is symplectomorphic to this domain, right? So if this is the case, then this R cannot be smaller than this one. So you cannot symplectically squeeze the ball, embed it symplectically to something which is smaller, like this. Okay? You cannot squeeze it. Okay? Uh, what is the meaning of the theorem? This theorem means that symplectic diffeomorphism, diffeomorphisms uh, have a very special form, a very special class in this whole class of volume-preserving maps. Because it is quite obvious, if you consider just a volume-preserving diffeomorphism from this ball to this domain, there are a lot. Even if when r is smaller than this r. You can consider here a very narrow domain, and this uh, domain will be very long, right? And you still can pro produce very easily a diffeomorphism from this ball to this domain, which uh, is, uh, uh, it, it is not a problem, and the volume will be the same, right? It's very easy. So there are no any restrictions on R and on R small and R big. But if you do it symplectically, it is impossible. You need this restriction. It can be very narrow, and this is a very precise estimate for this. So this means, for instance, that the ergodic theory which studies volume-preserving maps, is not an appropriate tool in order to study symplectic phenomena. In symplectic topology, in symplectic geometry, uh, new phenomena arise which cannot be explained just by ergodic tools. Okay? Just by, you cannot study symplectic maps just, by, just as volume-preserving maps. They have a lot of additional properties. So this is uh, one of the most... Uh, uh, known results uh, from Gromov's paper, applications. Uh, and you will see that this is an easy consequence of the previous theorem. So let us prove it. So proof.
Okay, so I consider here the standard structure, the standard complex structure, and I push it by phi here. Okay. What? Go ahead. Question? No. Okay. So. Yes. What? This is the radius of this ball. This is this is the ball R B. This is the ball R B. No, that's why. Uh, this is the ball of, of the radius R. Uh, this is R. This small R is here. Okay. So I can say, I take here the standard complex structure, which is here, and I push it by phi here. Okay, yeah, I, I obtain a new complex structure here on G. So consider the structure phi star of J stump. So let it be J. So it is defined. Well, if you want, let me proceed it a little bit. Uh, okay, so I consider here the sequence Rn, Rn, which tends to R. Okay, so I consider now the structure. I consider here the image. This is the image phi of R and B, okay, which is compact here, and this structure J is defined on the whole G. And now I consider the restriction of J on this compact. And I extend it from this compact uh, as a structure uh, which is smooth everywhere on C2 and uh, which coincides with the standard structure outside of G. How I do it? I just consider the complex matrix of, of, the, of the structure J on the, on the set. And I multiply this by a suitable cutoff function. Uh, and then I consider the corresponding almost complex structure. So we uh, extend it, extend it on C2 as an almost complex structure, as a C infinity almost complex structure, such that, almost complex structure J tilde, such that J tilde on C2 minus G bar coincide with J standard. Okay. So now we have the structure J tilde, which is outside of G. Our, my, structure, uh, my structure J tilde is standard one. Okay? So its, its, matrix, its matrix A vanishes outside of G. Okay? Its complex matrix A vanishes outside of G. So we can apply our theorem. We can apply our theorem. And by our theorem, we do the following things. So we consider here the origin. We, can here, we can see, consider here the point, the point Q, which is the center of the origin. Right? And now I claim that there exists some torus here, such that some J complex is constructed in my theorem, at this boundary glues to this torus, contains this point. So by theorem, there exists a J tilde complex disk such that its boundary, disk F, such that the boundary of this disk is contained in R B D times C, and the point Q, which is F of zero, is contained in this disk. Why this disk exists? Because we apply our theorem, obviously the, kind, the assumptions holds, and uh, we consider here the family of torus. And every torus is uh, filled by a Levy flat hypersurface. And we move this torus and this Levy flat hypersurfaces, it's easy to see, they fill everything here. So one of these disks contains our point. Okay. 
the area the area of this disk must be equal to pi r square. R square appears because here this is not the unit disk. This is the disk of the radius r. So uh, the area will be pi r square by our, uh, by our theorem about constructions of disks. And now we can consider the following. We consider the, the, this part of our disk, this intersection. So we consider uh, xm, which is uh, the pullback of f and d intersect with phi of r and b. Okay. So I consider the intersection also. In fact, all my, my, disk, my, my construction depends on n because uh, all the structures, because I do it for Rn, right? So all construction de depends on n. So now I consider this intersection what it is. This is the piece of my disk, which is here. Uh, the area of this piece is smaller than pr squared because this is a subset of my disk. On this part of my disk, phi is a biholomorphic map. It is biholomorphic with respect to the standard structure and the structure which I transpose by phi. It is biholomorphic. So this is usual complex curve, which is here. It is complex curve with respect to the standard structure, finally, because it is image of holomorphic map. Here, this is J-complex disk. Our map is holomorphic with respect to this structure. This structure, so when I push this disk here, I obtain complex disk with respect to initial structure. Right? So this is usual complex one-dimensional set. And the area of xn is smaller or equal than pr squared. Why this? Because our map is also symplectic. It preserves symplectic form. So for complex analytic curves, it preserves this, its, their area. So area will be the same because our map is symplectic. Well, then we can go to the limit if we want. By Bishop convergence theorem, we have a sequence of complex analytic sets uh, of bounded uh, of bounded uh, area. So, by Bishop convergence theorem for analytic sets, it converts to some uh, one-dimensional, one-dimensional complex analytic analytic set in the unit ball, such that. Zero is contained in X, so it is not empty. It is closed. And the area of X is smaller or equal than PR squared. In the, not in the unit ball, in this ball, I'm sorry. Well, but uh, by the classical result of uh, Pierre Lelon, you have also bounded in another sense. The area of these analytic sets is always bigger or equal than P multiplied by the radius of the ball. So if you have a complex analytic set here, which contains the origin one dimensional complex analytic set, then its area will be bigger or equal than pi multiplied by r squared. This is the result of Pierre Lelon. He obtained it in the 50s. So this is Lelon. So theorem is proved. So idea is uh, very typical for Gromov theory. What we did, uh, we perform a real change of variables, essentially, which is a rather unusual thing for classical complex analysis. 
Uh, phi is not a biholomorphic map with respect to the standard structure here and here. So we transport this structure by phi, and we view phi as a biholomorphic map for this structure. Now, uh, the geometry after this, so of course, in complex geometry, many obstacles uh, occur when you, because people consider usually uh, biholomorphic maps with respect to prescribed complex structures. If you do this, there are many obstacles. If you allow to consider essentially real transformations, then a lot of topological and geometrical problems disappear. But the price to pay is that here, Cauchy-Riemann equations for this structure become nonlinear. As we saw it, we obtain a quasi-linear system of Cauchy-Riemann equations, and we have to do analysis, which is much harder, in order to produce here holomorphic objects for this structure. But when we do it, we obtain interesting, interesting objects here, just pushing back our structure. And this is a very typical approach for Gromov theory. So finally, I, what, what, is, what we obtain at the end, we produced with all this machine, we produced in a true analytic set. With, with respect to the standard structure. Using all this machinery with Gromov compactness and so on, so on, we produced a true analytic set. Okay, okay so this concludes the proof uh, of Gromov non theorem, and uh, Sergei, in his lecture today, will prove this theorem in any dimension by, uh, by, other, by other methods, in fact. Okay, so uh, this is done, and in fact, I have no time in order to to go uh, to give other proofs of other things. So I will just explain a bit other results from Gromov's theory in higher dimension. So I will just state this result without proof. Uh, because uh, no, because uh, we apply the construction which I uh, explained yesterday, we consider uh, not just perturbation of the structure, but we ca we consider the disks for, for perturbed structure which uh, satisfy this boundary value problem. So we satisfy this equation. Uh, the boundary is attached to our torus, and this gives you uh, a nonlinear non linear boundary value problem for a quasi linear system of equations, and we solve it. So we, just, we, we, of course, we cannot, if we just perturb the structure, of course, our disk will move arbitrarily and the boundaries will not be. But we do it as I explained yesterday. So we impose this boundary condition and we apply implicit function theorem. In, uh, you, we saw Freeman Hilbert boundary yeah. value problem. So we must do all this using Maslow index, index and so on. So th that's what we do. And this guarantees that the disks will be attached uh, to, uh, to our torus. Okay. Unfortunately, it does not work in higher dimension. It doesn't work directly. So in higher dimension, I just, I just, I will just say one word about very striking result of in Gromov's paper. So higher dimensional case, just a general definition. Let E be a, well, in CN, be a compact uh, real submanifold of real dimension N. So we say that E is Lagrangian if uh, the restriction of the standard symplectic form on E is equal to zero. For instance, the tori, uh, the tori which I considered in uh, my theorem today are Lagrangian. They, they obviously satisfy uh, the, uh, this assumption. Okay, so we have this. 
uh, this condition, not necessarily in general, not necessarily imposed, but uh, I impose it intentionally because we are speaking only about Lagrangian manifolds or, uh, of maximum dimension. One can show, this is a good exercise, that every Lagrangian manifold is totally real. Is totally real. For, I'm speaking about the standard complex structure now. So, Gromov theorem is the following. Uh, let E be a compact Lagrangian manifold in CM. Then there exists a non-constant J standard complex disk with boundary glued to E. This is a very striking result, in fact. And its proof requires a very deep modification of this uh, two-dimensional approach, because the continuity method also is behind uh, this proof, but it is applied in a totally different way. In fact, uh, uh, Gromov consider the space of maps which satisfy non-homogeneous non -homogeneous d bar equation and the boundary, these boundary conditions. So he considered this, the solution, uh, and uh, the space of these maps uh, is called uh, the modular spaces uh, often of uh, complex curves. Uh, and uh, this is a, f a, a Banach manifold of infinite dimension. And in fact, uh, he uses a very clever version of the implicit function theorem, not, not the very elementary version which I described, but substantially more advanced version, which is called the sartz mayer theorem, and so on. And actually, he argues uh, by absurd. And in fact, these disks appear as a bubble. Because in my proof, uh, which I explained there in two-dimensional situation, uh, the main idea was to prove the absence of bubbles. And this uh, allows to, uh, to produce a very nice family of disks and Levy flat hyperturfaces and so on. Gromov idea is very different here. Gromov, and in fact, this construction, which I described in C2, uh, the, uh, the roots of this construction are very fine complex analysis. There are uh, classical papers of Bedford, uh, Gavo, Bedford, Klingenberg, and other uh, specialists in complex analysis who uh, applied a continuity method in two-dimensional situation. And then, after 80, uh, uh, at the end of 80s, uh, people stopped because it was a big problem how to go to higher dimension. And in fact, Gromov solved this problem uh, with very original idea. He produced just single disk, not family of hypersurfaces, not family of disks, not Levy flat hypersurfaces, not just a single disk, which in fact in his proof appears as a bubble. And this is very original and absolutely beautiful idea, which unfortunately <laughs> I cannot explain because uh, I need at least one, uh, one course for this. But it is written, in fact, in my notes. So if, in principle, you must have it uh, today. Well, so you, so well, you can read. Just one application of, uh, this, of this theorem, which also is in details explained in my notes. Very elementary consequence of this theorem, but I think rather striking existence of exotic symplectic structures. Exotic symplectic structures on 
R2n. Suppose that you have omega, a symplectic structure, a symplectic structure on R2n. It is called exotic if there are no, oh, okay, there does not exist a global diffeomorphism phi R2n to R2n such that phi conjugates omega to the standard structure. Okay. So locally, you can always uh, find this phi. Uh, locally, this is just Darboux theorem, right? Darboux theorem precisely says that locally, every symplectic structure is, is symplectomorphic to the standard one. But uh, if it is impossible to do globally, we say that omega, that omega is an exotic symplectic structure. It is not globally equivalent to the standard one. So consequence of this Gromov theorem is, so corollary, there exists an exotic symplectic structure. Of course, it is not obvious at all that they, uh, why they exist. Uh, and in fact, in order to construct the symplectic structure, you need to prove this. Uh, you need to use this theorem and to, uh, to obtain this theorem gives some very interesting topological restrictions uh, on Lagrangian tori, which are Lagrangian with respect to symplectic structure, and this allows to construct exotic symplectic structure. Because if you try to do it by hand, it does not work. So it is very interesting corollary of the theorem. Well, so it is written in my notes, and so I just, <laughs> sorry for this, that I have no time to explain it. So if you, have, if you will get this notes fi notice finally, and you, if you, you will have any questions, I will be happy to, to discuss it with you during the time which we still have, during these two days, okay? So I stop here.